Good evening. Good evening, saints. Welcome to our virtual Bible study. Glad you're able to join us this evening. Hope your heart and your mind is ready and prepared for our study tonight. Looking forward to getting back to the Word of God and uh, just deepening our understanding in areas of theology. And before we uh, dive into that, just some additional prayer requests and uh, that we want to add in light of what I mentioned on Sunday morning. A lot happens oftentimes between Sunday and Tuesday. I uh, just want to, and we'll we'll make sure as well that this is added onto the prayer list and the bulletin, but please add Sister Beverly Darnell. She has been taken back to the hospital, uh, just uh, some health concerns. So please be lifting her up in prayer, Sister Beverly Darnell and Sister Barkey. Uh, and she's taking care of her sister. So if you can please lift up uh, Sister Beverly Darnell. She was uh, admitted to the hospital recently, as well as Sister Marion Brown, Pastor Bob's wife, uh, health concerns. She was admitted to the hospital as well. Uh, both are in Baptist health. If you can lift them up in prayer. Uh, this morning, I had the opportunity to go by and see Sister Octavia Sanford. And praise the Lord, they found what they believe is the cause of her paralysis, her ability not to move her you know, move her legs. Uh, she might paralyze from the waist down. And so she had a procedure uh, this afternoon, haven't heard any word back, but let's continue to keep her uh, lifted up her spirits. Uh, she's trusting the Lord. I was thoroughly encouraged uh, by her faith in the Lord. So if you can please keep Sister Octavia in prayer. Also be in prayer for Brother Devrin and Aileen Muff. Their baby August had to be readmitted to the hospital, just having some 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 complications, uh, not serious, but but he is admitted. And you know how it is as new parents, uh, even something minor feels major. And so if you can keep, please lift them up in prayer and ask the Lord to even bless little August to, you know, be able to respond to the treatment. The doctors, the Lord, give them wisdom uh, of uh, helping out this little guy. So if you can please lift them up in prayer and reach out to them if you can with a text, let them know that you're praying. Uh, Sister Adrian Perkins, up and coming surgery on her shoulder, asking for prayer. Sister Trina Watson's mother, uh, Joyce Sanford, had a fall recently, so please be in prayer for her. Elder C had oral surgery today, uh, so we're praying that that went well. Uh, her sister Flo, mother Lois, heard surgery, asking for prayer. And then I mentioned on Sunday, uh, Shirley Simpson having surgery this uh, month. August the 23rd, if you can lift them up. And as we pray for those who are, you know, ill and things of that sort, you know, just think and reflect that there are moments uh, either throughout the day or past week, past month, past year, something could have happened and didn't happen. Uh, Deacon Paul Price had sent me a uh, text this afternoon of, uh, over at the Toyota uh, plant in Georgetown, uh, a truck had dumped some chemicals, nitrogen oxide, into the wrong tank, underground tank, and it caused some complications. Uh, they had to have everyone evacuate out of the buildings, and for six hours, they enjoyed a little piece of party. But he was just saying that, that if the chemicals are put into the, a, a wrong tank, it could have a big explosion could happen, and you know, 20 or so people, if not more, would have died. And so we bless the Lord. Uh, for his grace and mercy, and, and Sister Anna Lee works there. So uh, what could have happened is an expression of the mercies of God upon us. And so we bless the Lord, we praise the Lord for that. And that gives us encouragement as we take these concerns and present them before the Lord. Uh, he is concerned. He is not concerned as, in the sense as we are worried, but he cares. And so we want to do that this uh, afternoon. Let's do that right now. Father God, we thank you that is sinful as we are and how you made us lower than the angels. Yet the Bible says in Hebrews that you don't give aid to angels, but you do to the descendants of Abraham. Thank you, Jesus. And for us who are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, we are our spiritual, the children of Abraham. Yes. And you have come to our aid through Jesus Christ. And you have set him up to be our great high priest you, so that he can sympathize with us in our weakness. Mm -hmm. That he is a faithful and merciful high priest who made propitiation for our sins. And we know he accomplished that because he has sat down mm -hmm. at your right hand. All the other priests stood. Their work was never done. But Christ's finished work of redemption is complete. Yes. And we bless you for that. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Yes. And we ask, oh God, that you would be a healer for Sister Beverly Darnell and a comforter. 
uh, as well as for Sister Marion Brown and uh, Adrian Perkins and uh, Elder C, oh God, and that you'll be a, a strength and a help to Brother Mayor, uh, uh, Brother Devrin and Adlin, and that you would heal yes, baby Jesus. August, oh God. Yes, we ask yes. that you would be merciful to Trina Watson's mother. She had a recent fall, Lord God. That you would be a, a, a healer for Mother Lois Hurd, as well as for Sh Sister Shirley Simpson. Mm -hmm. And we bless you, oh God, for keeping a tragedy from happening at Toyota, Lord. We bless you, oh God. We understand yes. that there are a thousands of other tragedies that could have taken place uh, in our city and I'm sure millions throughout the world, Lord, that you kept from happening. Yes. And we just want to say thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Thank you. We thank you, oh God, that uh, you know our thoughts from afar, mm -hmm. that your thoughts towards us outnumber every grain of sand on every beach in the entire world. We thank you, oh Lord, that you, you have Lord. taken notice of us. Mm -hmm. So Psalm has said in Psalm 8, what is man that you would take notice of us, that you would care for us, uh, yes, 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 that you made yes, us a little lower yes. than the angels. You have crowned us, oh God, with dignity. We bless thank you for that. Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord God, it's only right, it, 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 it's only right that we come before you this evening to worship you, Lord mm -hmm. God, that there's nothing else uh, on a Tuesday evening that's worthy of our time, but to worship you. Mm -hmm. You are worthy yes, of Lord. our attention. You yes, are worthy Lord of our devotion. Yes, you are worthy Lord. of our praises. Yes, Lord. You are worthy for us to yes. grow and learn yes. how yes. great and awesome of a God you are. And as we yes. grow in the knowledge of you, there's a self-knowledge that we gain of ourselves yes. that is healthy for us. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord God, we pray. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just remember a thought of a former preacher, an old preacher of old, who said, when we come to the understanding of how unworthy we are, we've hit the mark. And, and the only way we can see how worthy we are is we see how worthy you are, that we see how unworthy we are. Yes. And yet, Lord God, you have loved us. Thank you. Lord. You have been merciful and gracious thank towards you, us. Lord. And we just want to say thank you this evening. Forgive us. Jesus. Forgive us of our trespass. Forgive us, oh God, for being uh, unthankful. Yes, oh God, forgive us, oh God, for complaining and murmuring. Yes, uh, forgive us, oh God, for being angry with you all oftentimes, oh God, in our hearts. So we may not verbalize it or raise our fists up to heaven, but we demonstrate by our attitude that we mm -hmm. don't like what you have ordained for us to go through. Uh, forgetting, oh God, that you are good and you do all things well. Forgetting, oh God, that you are wise and you're too wise to make a mistake. Wow. And even though we don't understand and we speak out in our ignorance, oh God, we're so thankful that you're slow to anger Thank and abundant Jesus. and loving kindness Thank and tender you, mercies. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, oh God, that goodness and mercy thank will follow you, us. We thank you, oh God, we can put these requests before you this evening, knowing that you care thank for you. us, oh God, thank and that you will answer in, in a way that glorifies you and for the good of your people. Thank we you. bless you for that. We trust you in that. Yes. And so, Lord, Lord, Lord God, we ask that your hand to be upon our Bible study. Holy Spirit, illuminate your word to our understanding. Sanctify us in thy truth. Your word is truth. We pray in Christ's name. Jesus. Amen and amen. Now we turn it over to Deacon Les Moore, or Sister Athena Sholar, lead us in songs of worship. Yes. 
Thank you, beautiful Athena Sholar, for leading us in that song of worship. One day we're going to study war no more. Wow, I mean, I think we've been so conditioned by being in a world of conflict that we, we oftentimes uh, don't reflect on the fact that one day we'll study war no more. We'll have to, we won't be dealing with the battles with the flesh, we won't be dealing with the battles of the world, and we'll definitely not be dealing with the battles of the devil anymore. Uh, one verse that sticks out to me, I think it's Romans 16, verse 20, where it says that God will soon put Satan under our feet. Powerful statement uh, of the utter defeat of the serpent of old. Uh, and, and one day uh, we will study war no more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Les Moore. Thank you, thank you Sister Athena Sholar. And we want to start in our study tonight. Uh, before we begin, there are some questions, a couple of questions that were sent to me. Uh, first one uh, is the question in relation to salvation, and it is, where in Scripture do we see regeneration precede faith? Now, let me, let me just actually explain what that question is getting at. Um, regeneration is to really bring back to life, okay? And from a spiritual perspective, we remember that in the garden, the Lord warned Adam that if you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dying you will die. That's literally how it is in the Hebrew. And when Adam ate, we did not see a physical death immediately. That, had, that, that, that began to happen progressively. And we get to chapter, uh, I believe, uh, five of Genesis and Adam dies like at 949 or something like that. But we do see immediate spiritual death. How? Well, we know that prior to the fall, that the Lord was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and there was a fellowship that Adam enjoyed with God. What happened when the Lord came into the garden after Adam ate of the fruit? He hid. So we see spiritual death there. Spiritual death means that man in his fallen nature is stubborn, resistant, does not seek after God, uh, actually 
does not want to come to God, lest his deeds be exposed, as it says in John 3. And Adam comes and the Lord seeks after Adam. Adam doesn't come to the Lord. The Lord comes to Adam. And who told you you were naked? You have these questions, right? And the Lord asks these questions to get Adam to confess. What does Adam do in his depravity, in his spiritual state of death? He blames his wife. No, in fact, he blames the Lord for his wife. <laughs> I mean, that's depravity. So when we ask the question of regeneration, we're saying that we see that death happened immediately from a spiritual perspective, that man was severed from his relationship with God. And therefore, how does regeneration, how does being brought back alive into fellowship with God take place? Does regeneration precede faith? Do we have to be awakened out of our deadness in order to respond by faith? And I believe there are, 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 are a number of scriptures, but two in particular that, that really convey that regeneration, that there is a work of awakening the heart from its deadness to respond to the gospel message of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. The first comes out of Acts, and this is a wonderful example for us of how regeneration, how God awakens the heart, opens the heart in order for the person to respond to the gospel. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. This is, uh, you, as you were familiar with this text, this is the Lydia of Thyatira. Paul comes into the Macedonia district, an area of Philippi. It says in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics. She was a wealthy woman. Purple fabrics were, were considered royalty, expensive clothes, a worshiper of God. That's a Gentile. So she would be considered a proselyte. A proselyte is someone who left their pagan religion to follow the religion of Judaism, okay? So they would be considered a, a, a God-fearer, right? So she's, she's not a believer, okay? A, a worshiper of God was listening. Listening to who? Listen to the apostle Paul. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul, okay? So the Lord opened her heart, that's regeneration. To respond to the things spoken by Paul is faith. So unless the Lord opens the heart, the sinner cannot respond by faith in the gospel, okay? Remember, faith and repentance are gifts. If it's a gift from God, that's not something that originates from within us. Uh, this is a text that I, I didn't think about adding, but let me add this now. Uh, if you make a left over to Acts chapter 11, and you remember the account where Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, the, the Gentile, right? He's one of the first Gentiles to be uh, saved in the early church. And after uh, Peter goes to Cornelius's house, he reports back uh, to the people in Jerusalem. Because uh, they, they, they stood up to, to Peter. They were upset that, that Peter would uh, go to the house of a Gentile. This is Acts chapter 11. Uh, let me just begin with verse 2 and verse 3 to give you the context. And when, and when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. And then from verse 4 on, he recounts the, 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 the situation, how the Lord met him and gave him that vision of the unclean food. and you know, take and eat, right? And then you get to verse 16. I'm going to go verse 15. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, as I began to speak in Cornelius' house, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. That's regeneration. He, he fell upon them. And I remembered the word of Jesus, of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So to be baptized by the Holy Spirit is not something that we do. Uh, just like John baptized sinners, they come to him and they become actually passive in the act. He takes them down and brings them up. The Holy Spirit in the work of, of, of salvation, he takes us down, baptized. He immerses us uh, in the life of Christ. We go down into death and rise up in spiritual resurrection, right? Notice this verse 17. If God therefore gave to them the same gift as he gave to us after believing the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in his way? Now, this is the point right here. And when they heard this, verse 18, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles 
also the repentance that leads to life. Wow. Repentance leads to life. And God granted that to them, the ability to repent. Okay. So we see the illustration of Lydia Thyatira. Lord opened up our heart in order to respond to the gospel that Paul was preaching. Now we turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. The question again is regeneration preceding faith. And this is just getting into uh, what theologians refer to in the Latin as ardo salutis, ardo, O-R-D-O, salutis, salvation, the order of salvation, okay? Now, we, we understand, well, we can only say this is all a package deal, like all this happens simultaneously, but the point of the scripture is to bring out that God is the one, he's the only one that can be credited with giving us the gift of salvation. It's, it's not a, 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 yes, we, he makes us to respond. He enables us to believe. He enables us to repent. I repented. I believed. You repented. You believe, but you can't even take credit for that. I cannot take credit for that. It's a gift, okay? Now, in Romans 8, verse 30, we have the order of salvation. I'm going to read verse 29 first. For those whom he foreknew, he knew beforehand, he also predestined, all right? To predestine is to decide beforehand, right? To, to determine your destiny beforehand. And he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So, how do we know all things are working together for our good? Well, because God has so set it up that you're becoming more and more like Jesus through the very experiences that you're going through in life so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, okay, he also called. Here's the order here. He predestined, predestined comes before the call. Predestined means that before times eternal, God had already beforehand determined our destiny that our destiny, that we will be saved in Christ. And then in time, he called us. And that Greek word called, kaleo, it, it, it's dealing with in the epistles. The epistles will be the letters from Romans to the book of Jude, okay? We have the history of Acts. We have the four gospels, right? Four gospels, then Acts, then Romans. And you go from Romans, the first thing, Corinthians, all the way down to Jude. When the word called is used in the epistles it's a salvific term dealing with the effectual drawing of god it's not the word it's the same greek word but used differently in the context of matthew i think like 22 where you have the parable of the the dinner and the king invites people to his dinner many are called but few or few are chosen and the epistles when it's speaking in reference to salvation it is it is the summons of god that that irresistibly draws a sinner to himself. Notice the order here, okay? Um, whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified. Okay, so pastor, what, what does the word call mean technically? The word call is addressing the call of God through the gospel and the response in the work of regeneration which leads to justify, to being just, so, so once you open up the heart, the call, right, and the heart is responding to the message, then call after call is justified. Well, what is the instrument that God uses in the human that leads to a declaration of righteousness that we refer to as justified? Romans 5.1. Uh, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification, okay, God's declaration of righteousness, we will see this in the next section, is, is, is that declaration is made when the sinner believes. But the sinner doesn't believe until he's called. What is called? Called is the work of God drawing. Then he draws, you exercise faith, God declares you righteous. Then he declares you righteous, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. That's a past tense uh, in the original, okay? That means that in the economy of God, what, did, what hasn't happened to you yet, in reality, 
is already done from God's purposes of what he has ordained, because what God purposes will come to pass. Nothing can thwart the purposes of God. Now, you might have a question. I mean, is call really like that? I mean, is it really in the epistles, this sort of effectual call, this power of God that irresistibly draws the sinner to respond to the gospel by which they exercise faith and are justified and glorified? Well, in the same book, if you take a left to Romans 4, same word is used in Romans 4. And it's in reference to Abraham in verse, uh, let's see, verse 17, okay? All right. Now, I'm going to read verse 16, and Paul is making the distinction that salvation in the Old Testament has always been by grace through faith. It was never works. Abraham believed God, and it was a credit to him as righteousness, right? And God did that before the law happened, which took place 400 years later. Uh, God declared Abraham righteous even before Abraham was circumcised, right? So going to verse 16 and verse 17 of Romans 4, Paul establishes the purpose behind faith because faith is a total reliance. It's just not a work. It's like you're totally relying upon the work that was done for you, for your salvation, okay? For this reason is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of law, but also those to whom uh, who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So, so faith works in accordance with grace. Faith is responding to the gift, but that response to the gift is the help of God by the spirit, right? And hope against hope. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 17. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you. In the sight of him, God, whom he believed, Abraham, even God. So, so God, God told Abraham, I'm going to change your name from Abram, um, exalted father, to Abraham, a father of multitude, before he had the multitude. And Abraham believed it, right? In the sight of him whom he believed even God. Why would Abraham believe? Well, you're in Genesis, right? And we're going to study this, Lord willing, in the evening service we go through Genesis. Genesis is all about God demonstrating that he's able, that to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he revealed himself as God Almighty. So when the God of the universe makes a promise to Abraham that I will produce in the dead womb of Sarah a child, and that child will bring about a nation, he believed. Why would Abraham believe that? On what evidence would Abraham have being 90 or, or at this time, 75 years old? What evidence would give Abraham the sense to believe that this God can do it? Notice what 17 says. In the sight of him whom we believe, even God, who gives life to the dead, here's the part, and calls, kaleo, into being that which does not exist. So when God made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to take the deadness of Sarah's womb, who I closed her womb, and I'm going to put life in it. Why would Abraham believe that? Because he sees the stars, he sees the moon, he sees the sun, he sees the trees, he sees water, he sees all that and says, God made, God called, he spoke, he called, and it's a divine summons call there. It's an authoritative, irresistible call. He calls into existence what did not exist. And the same word is spoken spiritually to us. God called life in a soul that was dead. Those he called who were dead, they responded with life and then they believed and were justified. So those are the examples I would give of, of how the New Testament in a number of places speak of regeneration preceding faith. Uh, now you say, okay, the command to believe and repent, they, they believe and repent, but we understand that in the, in, in, in the, in the work of God, that's why Acts is called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's drawing. Now, this is another example. This came to my mind. I'm preaching this Lord willing at the, uh, at our evangelistic outreach on Thursday at Douglas Park. You remember the account of Nicodemus, right? Coming to Jesus. They call it Nick at night, right? 
Nicodemus, this leader of the Pharisees, come to Jesus at night. And he says that we know that you have to be a God because you perform these miracles. And, and the Jewish mindset to perform miracles of healing and all these powers that Jesus Christ is demonstrating, even over the demonic realm, he has to be an instrument of God. This, this goes back to the Old Testament with Moses and, and with Elijah and Elisha. Uh, uh, they, they, they were clear spokesmen because God was doing something supernatural through them. And so Nicodemus acknowledges it. What was Jesus' response? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So from John 1, John chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, Jesus says you must be born again. And that statement, listen, is not an imperative. It's not a command. It's a fact. In order to go to heaven, you must be born again. And he gives the analogy because Nicodemus is like, I, I can't go back in my mama's womb and be born again. So he's taking spiritual teaching and he's speaking, he's speaking, taking Jesus' figurative language and literalizing it. He's making it literal. And, and Jesus has to break it down. Okay. To be born again means to be born from above. Uh, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So the earthly analogy of, of human birth is to be uh, a teaching of the, the spiritual reality. You cannot enter into God's kingdom unless you're born into it. So just like you and I had no choice in our own conception, okay? Mom and daddy came together, intimate, and we were conceived. <laughs> Jesus says you cannot even be conceived or born into the kingdom unless the spirit and the water, who are the parents? What's the water? The water, going back to Ezekiel 36, is speaking of the word, the, the, the word of God. is a spiritual cleansing agent. And the spirit, he's the one that moves and, and he produces the faith and the repentance of belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I, if you're born again, if you're saved tonight, that was because God produced that life in you. Okay, and you merely responded to the work or to the act. It was a supernatural work. So you have to go back if you have opportunity and read John 3, 1 through 8, and realize that nowhere in there is he giving Nicodemus a command that you got to be born again, just like you cannot command a baby to be conceived in the womb of a mother. Okay, the baby has no control over that. Okay, and that same way, spiritually speaking, uh, as far as being born in the kingdom. Now, are you responsible if you hear the gospel and, and, and you don't believe? Yes. Yes. But salvation is a gift. And God moves and draws those to himself. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that's clear. Uh, best way I, I can say it. Uh, if you have further questions on it, please, you can uh, email me on that. But that's the gift of salvation. God does it. He does it. Um, I don't know if you remember the statement in John 3 where he says the wind blows where it wants to. And, and and so it is of the spirit. Well, we never seen wind. You only see the effects of wind. And he's using that analogy again. That's how the spirit of God works. He, you, you, we, we'll, we'll go out and preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit will move. And you don't know, you can't see him moving until you see the effects of his movement. When someone says, I want to believe, I, I want to turn from my sins. I don't want to live this life no more. I, I, I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That happened to all of us tonight. Uh, I was saved in church. Seven people came up with me in uh, September of 92. They all publicly were professing they wanted to exercise faith in Christ. I was the only one out of the seven that demonstrated by the grace of God fruit. Because all the rest went back into the world. When I, I was on campus, I saw them. But God did something different in me. He, he, he drew me and he enabled me. When I couldn't even, I, I didn't even know what repentance meant, but I knew I repented. I simply said, Lord, I don't want this life no more. I'm 19 years old. I'm, I'm, I, I know too much that if I die, I'm going to hell tonight. And God convicted me of my sins and, 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 and drew me to himself. That's, that's all of our testimonies. That's all of our testimonies. So I hope that answers the question of uh, re regeneration preceding faith. Now, there's a second question. 
that aligns with our study tonight. And so uh, we'll turn to our notes. If there are any other questions, uh, raise your hand if you have your video on. If you don't have your video on, uh, you can put a question in the chat. And of course, you can also have my email, uh, Brother Les. Make sure that when you send an email to me that you put Pastor Vic, and then after BIC, you put the number six, uh, or else it won't go through. So uh, we're a family of six, right? So it's Pastor Vic, number six at gmail.com. And you can send me your answers and your questions, I mean, and, and I'll do my best to answer. All right. I hope that was clear. Okay. All right. Um, if you don't have any questions, and we'll dive into our our lesson tonight, I want to just go back and review something I said last week for clarification. And this goes along with the question that was asked of the distinction. And we're on page 10 in our notes under the, the heading of the inerrancy of scripture. So we're in the section now. We're going through what is reformed theology. Reform is just a label that we use more from a historical perspective of what took place in the Reformation in the 16th century. But reform theology is really biblical theology, okay? We're studying the Bible, and we're studying uh, uh, key subjects within the scripture, okay, that are the foundations of the Christian faith, okay? So what is reform theology? We talked about that. What are the foundations of reform theology, which is going to be the foundations of the gospel? It's centered on God based on God's word alone, that's where we are in this section now, is committed to faith alone and devoted to Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, a fifth element we'll add on later, and we'll talk about why we would not consider ourselves, uh, you know, believing in covenant theology. We'll talk about that. It really boils down to Israel and the church, okay? But we're in this section dealing with it that is based on God's word alone, and we want to encourage us, remind ourselves of the nature of scripture. So when Moses, as he's in the wilderness for 40 years, he writes Genesis, he writes Exodus, he writes uh, uh, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And this is what he hands off to Joshua, okay? And the people of Israel believed that the law of Moses was the law of God, that God moved Moses to write the law, okay? And so it's, it's called dual authorship, two persons. Uh, God and Moses wrote the law, okay? And as Moses is giving this law to Israel going into the promised land, they have a detailed account from origins to the exodus to God's will for them in the law concerning God's will for Israel, right? So that when Israel gets into the land of the Canaanites, they have all these, the Canaanites have all these different gods, the gods of Baal and Ashtoreth, right? And Molech, right? And so they have the law, the word of God. And in their law, they're saying that, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we are not look to Baal, who's the God of the rain. Why would we look to Baal? Well, because we're, we're, we, we live off the land and we, we're, this is an agrarian society. We, we, we depend upon the rain for the harvest. So, but we know that God, Yahweh, he's the one that created the heavens and the earth. He's the one that controls the rain. We have it right here in the word of God. This is what we follow. And therefore we don't follow those false gods because there are no true gods, but the true, there are no other gods, but the true and living God. So we see from Israel's perspective, the way the law of God worked, just like it works with us, it was their theology, their faith was based on the word of God alone. It was not to incorporate the religions of the nations. This is what the Lord warns them about, right? Joshua gets that law. During his time, he writes the book of Joshua, okay? And then that's incorporated and added, and the people of Israel recognize that is the word of God. And then you con it continues on all the way to the last book in our New Testament, our old, the last book in our Old Testament is the book of Malachi, right? So Israel up until that point had accumulated 39 books and it became referred to as the law and the prophets. And the prophets were determined to be the spokesmen of God because they called the people back to the law. They demonstrated that they were spokesmen for God because they either demonstrated 
supernatural power through miracles like Moses and Elijah and Elisha, or they prophesied, they, they, they did some foretelling and things came to pass. And the people say, well, only God knows the future. So this must be a prophet of God. And they took their writings and incorporated it. And you have the 39 books, right? Okay. All right. Then you have Jesus comes on the scene. He gathers around himself 12 disciples. Okay. And then uh, he, death, burial, resurrection, he ascends. He says, I'm going to send you another helper. The other helper is the Holy Spirit. And he says it to the disciples on the night of his betrayal, who will bring back to your remembrance all that I taught you. So three and a half years of teaching. They didn't have, they weren't, they didn't have their notebooks out and writing, taking notes. The Holy Spirit brought it back to them, all the teachings of Jesus, so that Matthew wrote his gospel, moved by the Holy Spirit. And he took uh, genealogical records and he began the gospel of Matthew that way as a connection to the Old Testament. How do we know Jesus is the Messiah? Well, let me begin with the genealogical record. Abraham and then Abraham to David and David to Joseph, right? And he's the legal father of our Lord. And he begins to write his gospel account. Then Luke writes his. Then Mark writes his. Then John writes his. And then you have Luke writing his second volume in the book of Acts. And then the Lord saves Paul. Paul writes 13 epistles, right? John writes his epistles. The Hebrew writer, who's not an apostle, writes his epistle. James writes his epistle. Jude writes his epistle. Peter writes his epistle. Then you have John, the one whom Jesus loved, who wrote the gospels in the first letters of John and second John and third, writes the last book of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And we see that he concludes Revelation with a warning in chapter 22, don't add. So basically, we're saying that when he writes, don't add any more to the book of Revelation, if the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, to add to it is to add another book. And he says there's a, there's a judgment for that. So what John is writing, he's saying that from Genesis to Revelation, what God has had to say to us is complete. Am I making sense? Am I clear, Liz? Have I lost anybody, Liz? Liz typically lets me know where I'm either going too fast or I need to back up, okay? But what I've just given you was a, a comprehensive understanding of how God moved Moses and the prophets and how Israel, as they are getting these books, they recognize these are the books of the Lord. These, these are, this, is, this is our scripture. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, he gets his apostles and the Holy Spirit reminds them uh, of the earthly ministry of Jesus in the gospels. And then he begins to articulate the historical event of Jesus. What happened? I mean, what actually took place when he died on that cross? What, what, what happened when he was nailed? What happened when it got dark and, 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 and he cried out, my God, my God, why art thou forsaken me? You know, one of the biggest movies that came out uh, years ago was a movie directed by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ. And, uh, in that movie, you, you, you have the, the passion, which means the suffering of Jesus. And I can remember my wife and I going to the theater, watching the movie, and people in the theater just weeping. They're weeping as they see this actor being scourged. And, and they have May, Mary betrayed there, and she, she wants to help her son. And, she, and she's having flashbacks when she was raising Jesus, and he would fall, a three-year-old. And, and she's like trying to get to him. He's carrying, you know, the cross beam and he's falling and then people are weeping and, and he's, he's looking, you know, he's all bloodied up and he's crucified and he's speaking Aramaic and all of this and people are weeping. People were weeping at, at the person betraying Jesus as an innocent man being whipped to death and they felt a sense of sorrow. Okay. When you watch movies like The Passion of the Christ or The King of Kings, unless you read the epistles that gives you what was going on, we see a human, we see a man on a cross. Not everybody had the same conclusion when they saw Jesus on that cross. Pharisee says, oh, look at him. Uh, he saved others, he can't save himself. The, the thieves on the cross are saying, well, you, you, you know, I mean, if you can save, you know, save us. And they were, and people were mocking Jesus and blaspheming. No one knew what was actually going on 
on that cross, but Jesus and the Father. They don't, they weren't comprehending that an exchange was taking place where Jesus was bearing our sins and the Father was judging his son in our place. You can't know that until you read the epistles that say, let me give you the spiritual. You saw what happened historically. We, we believe in the historical event of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let me let you know the theological implications of that event. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He was, uh, he, he, uh, he was, uh, what's the word did he use? Uh, let me, let me, let me, no, it's right here, verse 25. He was delivered up on the cross for our transgressions. He was raised for our justification. So, I mean, Paul is writing this and Peter's writing this. They're blown away that what I saw on that cross, Peter said, what John saw on that cross was an actual exchange where Jesus was carrying my sin. He was my sin bearer. And the father calls it to be dark to demonstrate his judgment upon his son in my place. When Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lamb the Sabachthani, they said, oh, he's calling for Elijah. No, he wasn't. They didn't know what he was calling out. They didn't know that he was crying out, my God, my God, why art thou forsaken me? Why am I saying all this? Well, God, the Spirit, moves upon the apostles to record in the letters what Christ accomplished for our salvation. Okay? And John concludes by saying he's coming back. And he says, don't add to that. It's complete. So what they were writing takes us to our notes. We believe that what they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was infallible and inerrant. Now we get to the definition and the second question for tonight. Page 10 on our notes under the heading, the inerrancy of scripture. That's what's at stake when I'm talking this, okay? When I'm sharing this, okay? Infallibility means that Something cannot err. If you say, if I say I'm infallible, that means I don't make no mistakes. It's impossible for me. I'm perfect. So infallibility as it relates to the scripture is that it cannot err. While inerrancy means it does not err. So in the notes here, if you can put the notes back up on page 10, uh, infallibility means that something cannot err, while inerrancy means that it does not err. Infallibility describes ability or potential. It, it, it doesn't, it's, it's what it, it's incapable of doing. It, it won't lead you. It can't do that because God cannot himself mislead you. It's impossible. God is a God of truth. He's holy. So it, it's describing something that cannot happen. Inerrancy describes actuality. It does not happen. So an infallibility means it does not mislead you. Inerrancy, it, 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 it actually won't lead, mislead you, okay? All right? So infallibility says, I, I take the Bible, and I believe that it does not err. If I believe it does not err, let me exercise that faith by reading it and discovering it actually did not err. It didn't, when I applied it, it didn't mislead me. I mean, how many times we read the Bible, and we know we believe it's infallible, but we don't apply it. So infallibility means that, that, the, that the contents, the words of God, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God written by man, that he moved by the Spirit to write, it, it cannot err and it does not err. Okay, so, so I hope that, and the distinction is given in the illustration that this bro gives. He says in the next statement, I suppose I, I, I score 100% a, a on the spelling test. And that in this limited experience, I was inerrant. I, I, I didn't err. I made no mistakes on the test. But this would not warrant the conclusion, I'm therefore infallible, that I cannot err. Because let's say he has a next spelling test, and he, he, he flunks it. Okay? So uh, so I hope that's, that's, that's somewhat helpful in, in the distinctions. Go back and, and read that in your notes. Um, now, we stated this is, last is, week. Is that a good summary right there? That's good. Infallible, cap incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. And dealing with ability. I like that. Inerrancy, lack of error, actuality. Great. Amen. Thank you, Les. 
Thank you, Deacon. You're on it, brother. Um, boy, time goes by so fast. Let's go back to the notes real quick. I, I want to make this statement. I, I mentioned in our copies. Now, when we talk about inerrancy and infallibility, we're saying it doesn't extend to the copies. Copies mean, you know, scribes were were experts. They they were actually the word scribe in the Greek deals with a grammarian. They they were they were into grammar. They were into studying the law meticulously, and they made copies. Right? They make so let's say that the after John wrote Revelation uh, and letters that Paul was writing and sending to the Corinthians, they took those letters and they made copies. They made copies. They made copies and. And of course, we take those copies and uh, from the Old Testament, New Testament, translating from the original languages of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and we have our English translations. Now, we don't say, because the ones that translated it, we don't say that they were inerrant and infallible. Um, they were just merely humans utilizing their education and abilities as grammarians to, to copy. But when John wrote his and Peter wrote his letter, the Spirit of God moved upon them and enabled them to write uh, uh, the Scripture in a way that was infallible and inerrant, okay? Now, I mentioned last week we showed that there were some mistakes in, in one particular translation of King James where it says uh, Azahiah was uh, 42 when technically he was 22. And I don't want you all to be disturbed by that because the translators picked it up. That's why they make the, note, the notations in your Bibles. So, so they go back and they review the, all the manuscripts. They review all the manuscripts and they will notate when a particular manuscript has made a mistake and put it in your translation. Uh, so what we have, uh, we have an accurate translation that goes back to the originals, okay? So even though we might not say inerrant and infallible, which we say were the original autographs, but we do have an accurate translation. You can trust it. And again, we can get into a whole issue of, of translations later on if you're interested in knowing that. But the study of translations is under the it's it's, it's under the uh, the disciplines of textual criticism. So scholars go back and review copies, the earliest copies. And someone asked me uh, recently about the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the story of a, a little boy throwing rocks into a cave and begins to hear the breaking of pottery and discovers these well-preserved um, uh, scripture texts that have been copied by the Essenes. Essenes were a group of people who lived out in the, in the dry desert areas and they made copy, they were well-preserved copies of the book of Isaiah, Old Testament books. And so in certain places, I think they, they have either copies or they have the originals. Uh, I think the British Museum uh, have uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, if, I, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But anyway, they're, they're copies. And, and, and the copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, are proof of how meticulous uh, grammarians or scribes were in preserving the text. They, they made sure that they, they uh, copied the best, you know, copied it and reviewed it and copied, copied and preserved the word of God so that now when we have our translations today, we have an accurate translation from the original. That's all that to say. So the word of God is the word of God and it's still authoritative for us. And we know because through this copy, you got saved, I got saved. <laughs> That's the power of God and the copies itself, okay? So God has preserved his word, all that to say. He's preserved his word. Um, can I use this illustration to piggyback on this? I'll read it on page 10 and we'll be done with our time tonight. It's dealing with an illustration of the yardstick, okay? And, and Sprog is a good illustration here. Uh, suppose the normative yardstick housed at the National Bureau of Standards was the parish in a fire. Will we no longer be able to determine the distance of three feet? It's supposed to be three feet with accuracy. With the multitude of existing copies, we could reconstruct with almost perfect accuracy the original yardstick. To restrict inerrancy to the original documents is to call attention to the source of biblical revelation. The agents who were inspired by God to receive his revelation and record it. Reformed theology carries no belief or no, yeah, it's supposed to be, the thing's belief uh, for the in, infallibility of translations. We who read, interpret, or translate the Bible are fallible. But even, in, even though we're capable of making mistakes, and there have been some, the accurate 
uh, study or discipline of textual criticism has picked up those mistakes and has notated those mistakes in certain translations so that you can say, oh, okay. And typically, again, the only sort of mistakes you'll find are like questions of, uh, or like the copy of an age. And you go back and you say, oh, we see well, that, that was a mistake. It's supposed to be 22 instead of 42. None of that has any sort of, poses any threat to what we're studying here as far as the essentials of the word of God, who God is. You're not gonna find a mistake in a translation about who God is or salvation or anything like that. It's typically minor, very minor sort of mistakes and copies that are picked up by the translators and notated in a good study Bible. So you don't get misled or you don't end up you know, accepting something, okay? And that's the blessings of translations and scholarship in that. Lord willing, next week, we're going to cover this, the, the study of the authority of Scripture. Now, let me just conclude with this. I want to conclude with this thought. Um, there are a number of, um, let's say, persons out there today. And for you, if you're not on social media, you know, it, it, it you know, it, you don't get exposed to it as much. I, I think uh, maybe, uh, I think the word think tanks is sometimes used of people who are the the key people that you look to 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 give you understanding of certain aspects of uh, of disciplines in the world today. They're the think tanks. These are the ones that are supposed to be the experts, and you hear them get interviewed on various news stations, and they tell you what they think as far as uh, uh, global warming and climate control, and you, you because you don't study it and none of us claim to be omnicompetent that we know everything. We're competent enough to know everything. We believe what they say, right? Even in the area of theology, discussions of theology, there are those that today consider themselves thought leaders. Thought leaders are those who think for us. In other words, they put themselves in a position that they are to think for us when it comes to matters of the word of God and, and theology, the things of God. And I want to encourage you as we're going through this study on what is Reformed theology and in this section, particularly on the word of God alone, what I'm aiming at as, as, as your pastor, as your shepherd, is I want for you what I wanted for myself when the Lord saved me. I wanted to know the word of God the best way I could. I just want to be a student of scripture. All of us are theologians. All of us. All of us have a belief when it comes to God. The question is, are you a good theologian or a bad theologian? And I want us to be Bereans. I want us to be like the Berean church, uh, where when they heard the great apostle Paul teach, they went back and opened up their Bibles and said, let me see whether what he said was true or not. They didn't take it wholesale. And sometimes, you know, we can have thought leaders, uh, uh, famous preachers uh, out there that we admire or we like, or we see that they have a big church. And we assume because they have a big church, that must be the hand of God on their ministry. While in fact, numbers is never a sign of whether God's hand of favor is upon your ministry. Uh, the devil can have all kinds of numbers. He can draw all kinds of people for a crowd. What I'm saying is that even when you might respect someone from having a title or whatever, Never lose that sense of being a student of the word, okay? We want the Bible. This goes into a segue to our study next week on the authority of scripture. Let me give an example, a small example. I saw a brother do this. A brother that I know of did this. He, he put up a, a, a statement on social media and uh, there's no black church. There's no white church. It's just the church of Jesus Christ. And then you find a lot of people liking it and, 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 and and sharing it, and you know, and it's like, okay, all right. Um, but there are black churches, there are white churches, there are Hispanic churches, there are Asian churches. Is that wrong to say to identify that way? And then I came across this scripture in Romans sixteen verse four. Romans sixteen verse four says this interesting statement towards the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, verse four. Uh, I threw this on less than last minute. He's going to put the text up for us. But Paul is giving his last shout outs to the, to, to, to the people in Rome. And he's telling the, the Roman church, he says, verse three, greet Prisca and Aquila or Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Romans 16, verse four. And Priscilla and Aquila, who for my life risked risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the what? Gentiles. 
So Paul identifies churches by their ethnicity. He didn't say church of the Jews. He said church of the Gentiles. So is it wrong to, to say and identify a church based, based on the majority of those who are of a particular ethnicity? No, there's nothing wrong with that. And we're not denying it, that it's the church of Christ either. Uh, if you skip over to verse 16, as I close, um, he says, greet one another with the holy kiss, all the churches of what? Christ. So all the churches of Christ oftentimes will be made up of various ethnicities. So there'll be a predominantly Anglo church. There'll be a predominantly African-American church. There'll be a predominantly Asian church. There'll be a predominantly Hispanic church. And I don't think that's wrong with it. And we shouldn't deny our ethnicities because God God did that. He purposed that. So, but but it's 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 wrong when we become idols. We we, we make ethnicity an issue of idolatry. But it's nothing wrong with identifying uh, with an ethnicity as far as the church. Uh, Paul acknowledges this is the church of the Gentiles, and they're all the church of Christ. So that's a, that's just like a small minor. I'm not trying to just get on the high horse with that. I'm just saying when you you listen to things and you hear people teach, whether it's through audio, television, social media, have your Bible open. Um, ask yourself certain questions. Another question, I'm done, I'm done. One guy said, well, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament should not be called the Old, the old Covenant. It shouldn't be called the Old Covenant because Abraham was not in the Old Covenant. That's true. Abraham was not in the Old Covenant. He, didn't, he wasn't around when the law of God was given, the Ten Commandments were given. But if you read your Bible, Paul refers to the Old Testament as the Old Covenant. Jesus refers to the writings of Moses as the law. Again, people say things, and I think they're well-meaning sometimes. They, they, they're, they're on to something, but they haven't really fact-checked it. I want us to fact-check. Fact-check me. Please, please fact-check me. Because uh, I'm a student of the word. I'm not infallible. Okay? I'm not inerrant. That goes back to the whole point. Only the word of God. Okay? And that's what we want to hold up as the standard of evaluating everything in our personal life and in the church. It's the word of God that's the authority. Hear me on that, okay? I'm not the authority, okay? The Bible's the authority. And I, I just, again, want to emphasize that the, more and more and more, over and over again, and that's will lead us to our next study on next week, the authority of scripture, amen? Thank you for allowing me a couple of minutes over. As we conclude our time, just want to remind you of our Douglas Park Evangelistic Outreach this coming Thursday at 6 p.m., okay, and please be in prayer. Pray, pray for not only myself to preach, uh, but pray the Lord would draw, draw, the Lord would save. That's why we're going out there, not just to, not just to be uh, visible in the community. We want God to bring souls to himself. We're, we're fishermen. We're asking God to cause the fish to eat, the, to bite the bait so we can draw them in. Amen. So please pray for that. Um, Please pray for the other requests we made uh, for those who are ill. And is, again, want to encourage you to give. Amen. We know our three means, uh, three ways of giving, online, mail-in, and drop-off. Uh, give to the chapel, but also let's make sure we're being consistent in our general offering as well. Uh, let's give as the Lord has so provided. Amen. And if we come up short, we know God's going to provide uh, everything, everything we stand in need of. So I'm optimistic about that. Uh, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply, a great preacher said, uh, Hudson Taylor years ago, it stays with me. God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. And we want to do God's work God's way, according to his word, and we trust him to supply our needs. Amen? Amen. So please be praying. Four-point prayer emphasis. Keep praying each day. Let's pray. Father, we bless you tonight. Thank you for your word. Pray this was helpful, O oh God. Pray that our minds have been illumined by the reality of your word being infallible and inerrant and authoritative in all matters of faith and practice. And may we cling to your word like a light shining in a dark place. And the world around us is indeed dark. And the only light we have to help us walk in this dark world is the word of God. So, Lord, I pray you would help us provide for our financial needs, be with those who are ill, be with little baby August. Uh, be with all of us, O oh God, and you you know our needs, and we pray you supply it according to your riches and glory. Thank you for our time tonight. In Christ's name, amen.